Last lecture, we started the aggregate demand, aggregate supply uh, model. We tried to explain how we can use this model for policy analysis and also to understand economic fluctuations um, and what the policy response uh, should be in different situation if we have a demand shock or um, supply side shock. So what I, what I want to do first, I want to um, just give a very brief recap of what we did and then how we're going to build on that to understand more the aggregate supply curve. So if you remember, we didn't have much to say about uh, the aggregate demand because we already understand that the aggregate demand is a downward sloping curve, as you can see. Um, you see in the horizontal axis, we have output level. On the vertical axis, we have um, price level. Uh, so it's, it's a downward sloping curve. That shouldn't be a problem. We've done that before. We understand what can shift the aggregate demand curve to the right and what can shift the aggregate demand curve to, to the left. Um, but the main point or the important point that you should understand from the previous lecture, which we will actually carry on and explain this in more detail today, is the aggregate supply curve. Over the last, over the first four, five lectures, we assume that prices are fixed. So that's an extreme assumption that we assume that prices do not change. And that's why we said in the short run, we will have a horizontal curve. The aggregate supply uh, curve will be a horizontal line in the short run, if we assume fixed prices. But then the opposite case, in the long run, when you have um, all prices are flexible, so um, you would have a, a vertical aggregate supply uh, curve. So the long run aggregate supply curve would be a vertical line. So if we relax the assumption about prices in the short run, meaning if we assume that prices are not fixed, but in the same time we should understand they're not as flexible as they would be in uh, the long run, so that's why we would have uh, an upward sloping uh, aggregates of like here, which we uh, derived uh, when we discussed the labor market uh, lecture. So. We, we built on that, we, we just tried to think, uh, to understand or to give more detail about what would determine the output level in the short run. Obviously, it would be the, um, any changes to the aggregate demand. So aggregate demand or output in the short, the equilibrium output in the short run is mainly determined by the aggregate demand and changes to aggregate demand wouldn't have any uh, nominal effect. They would have real effect, meaning they change the output level. Um, and we also looked at how um, in the long run how this would look like. So in the long run, rather than having um, or assuming that prices are, are fixed or do not change, we understand in the long run prices are perfectly uh, uh, flexible and that's what explained the vertical line and that vertical line which is the long run aggregate supply, where is going to be? It's going to be where the um, full employment output level is, which is equivalent to the natural, or this is where the natural rate of unemployment or natural rate of employment. Um, so it's very important to understand that then, once we have a vertical line, once we have uh, an aggregate supply curve that is a vertical line, then any change in demand side policies wouldn't have any real effect. So that you'd have only nominal effect, meaning they will change price level, okay? Not the output level. So in the long run, monetary policy or uh, physical policies 
these are going to have nominal effects, not real effect, meaning they're not going to change the real output level. So um, then that's how it looks like in the long run. We have a long run aggregate supply curve. And then as you see, moving or shifting the aggregate demand curve upward or downward wouldn't have any impact on the output level because the output level here, as you can see, at the um, uh, full employment uh, output level or the potential output and raising or, or shifting the, um, the aggregate demand curve upward or even shifting this downward is not going to make any difference to why, but the effect will be mainly through uh, the price level. So we build on that and we, saw, we show that how demand side uh, policies in the long run would have no real effect. And we explain that when prices are fixed, so you could move from point A, for example, here to point uh, B as a respond to, let's say, an expansionary physical or monetary policy. So you will have like a temporary gap where you have the actual output is beyond or above the uh, full employment output level. Uh, because prices do not uh, adjust or in the very short run or do not change in the very short run, but once you allow or you relax this assumption, once you give time to prices to adjust, and prices here again include uh, wages, so all prices. So that means once prices adjust, we go back because of the higher demand since that we have a higher income now or Y is greater than Y bar. So that means a higher demand which will put upward pressure on the price level and then we'll, we'll tend to move back to the uh, long run equilibrium which point C. Okay. And this, this takes time, so it's, it's an adjustment process, so it, it, it keeps going, so that pressure keeps going until we reach that point where the aggregate demand uh, curve intersects with the long run aggregate supply, and that's where the equilibrium in the long run will take place. Okay, so this is something we already discussed, and uh, one interesting thing we explained last lecture again is the business cycles or economic fluctuations, how we could use the aggregate demand, aggregate supply model to explain these fluctuations. And as I said, you could, uh, in the short run, you could have uh, Y above or below the natural level or the full employment level, which is Y bar. So you could find Y or actual Y in the short run above that or before that. So if it's above that, so we have like infinite, inf inflationary gap. Um, if it is below the, um, the uh, full employment uh, output level, so it's, if it is b below the Y bar, so that means we have a recessionary gap. And again, these in the short run could be uh, dealt with with the um, uh, demand side policies. But uh, as I said, so the economy will tend to, to move toward that long run equilibrium. And we show the example, the, uh, this is an example, uh, is an example from the US economy and how these fluctuations happen. So these ups and downs around the long run uh, trend. And then we start talking about shocks when we have an expected uh, change or expected uh, or an exogenous shocks to supply or demand and how that uh, would translate in the short run to uh, some gap and then how we how this gap or how the economy will adjust again just remember all these adjustments happen uh, because prices adjust okay so your adjusting mechanism here is the change in prices so once you allow prices to change okay i know we we've been assuming that for for some time now for a couple of weeks we said prices are fixed it will take prices as as is so we're not going to think how prices may respond to changes or different changes. But now, since that we make this now, we're moving from the very short run toward the long run, we should understand that this adjustment happened through the uh, prices. And once prices adjust, then we move back to the long run uh, equilibrium. Uh, we show some examples of demand shocks. Um, 
if consumers for whatever reasons or if consumers or investors for whatever reason they have less confidence in the economy so that mean that means a negative demand shock if they for whatever reason there must be some um, or any economic reforms happen that made them uh, I mean economic agents in general or investors and and consumers in particular made, made them more optimistic about the future, about this economy, so they can, they kind of, that, they are more confident in that economy now, so that because of that change, so that means there's a positive uh, demand uh, shock, and, and the gradual adjustment of prices will help us to move toward, again, uh, the long-run equilibrium. Again, when I talk about the long-run equilibrium, I'm talking about that Y bar, or uh, that point where we have the natural rate of, uh, or the unemployment rate equal the natural rate of uh, unemployment as well. Um, this was an example of um, a negative demand shock and how prices would adjust over time. We did that before. Um, but then we also discussed different examples of uh, supply shocks. Uh, when we talk about supply shocks, again, it's anything that can happen again surprise or an exogenous change or an exogenous shock or an exogenous event that can alter production cost and affect the prices okay so one of the very popular examples here is the um, oil price shock which we discuss in detail but you, but you, but you could apply this in any other situation any other situation? Is that true? Can anyone give me another example of a negative supply shock? A recent example, perhaps? Exactly. Yeah? So the outbreak of coronavirus will have some disruption to supply side. Okay? And you could use that to analyze the situation. So what I'm trying to say here is that don't be surprised, um, or you should use that model to analyze different uh, shocks. It would help you to understand what sort of policies can help. Um, uh, so, so what we focused on last week was, or last lecture was a negative oil price shock, but this can be applied in different situations, okay? So whenever a shock happens, then you need to think about, is it a demand side shock? Is it a supply side shock? How this is going to translate, or how can I show that, or how can I analyze this using aggregate demand and aggregate supply uh, model, okay? So the outbreak of coronavirus is, is an example of this type of shocks, especially if it caused um, a major disruption to uh, production. Um, obviously, that will be a negative supply shock. And then you could use that uh, sort of analysis to explain the effect uh, on the economy. Uh, so that's why I said, um, when I started talking about the aggregate demand and aggregate supply shock, I said this is a very convenient, a very simple toolkit that can help you analyze different uh, situation, different economic policies. So it's a really good idea to understand, to try to understand this uh, model uh, very well because it will help you to maybe to apply uh, this to a different different type of analysis. So as I said in the lecture, we, we focused on oil uh, negative uh, shocks, uh, supply shocks, and we show how this affect the short run aggregate supply. Obviously, when you have a negative uh, supply shock, what would happen to the short run aggregate supply curve? Just for now, we assume that prices are fixed, okay? So as, as we explained in the previous lecture, as we explained in the previous lecture, we said this is an extreme case. This is a very strong assumption to assume that all prices in the economy are fixed, but it helps us to understand or to, to make the analysis very simple. And then today we'll, we'll, we'll depart from this assumption, so we relax this assumption. But now, since we have a, a short-run aggregate supply curve when we have um, um, a negative supply shock, so we would imagine that that shift will, uh, that, that curve or that horizontal line will shift upward, okay? Because prices rise or the cost of production increase and uh, the prices increase accordingly as well. 
And we show that how you could, this is just an example, we show how, I think we show how, we should also how to, how can um, um, uh, stabilizing policies like uh, uh, physical and, and monetary policy, policies can, can, can be used to, to uh, offset the effect of a negative uh, shock. I think that's exactly what we showed last time. So we have here a negative shock. You have the horizontal line, the short run aggregate supply curve, shift upward, and then to have said that to move from point A to point C without suffering uh, from a recessionary gap, which would have been somewhere here to the left. Okay, so to do that, then you need to that negative shock need to be a combined by uh, an expansionary shock. Uh, sorry, an expansionary uh, policy uh, where monetary policy or um, or fiscal policy uh, that would help to help the economy to move from point A to point C. If you hear the uh, budget statement in the UK, and was it Wednesday, you would hear that all the discussion from the council, from the from the uh, government, what they from the chancellor, they mainly were talking about how much money they made available to support, okay? So that's a massive expansion here or physical policy, different direction now. So it's not going to be like expansionary policy. They try to, they understand there is, there's a negative shock. There's a negative supply shock here. And to have said that shock, we need to inject the economy with more spending, hopefully. So that, that means the government over the next few weeks or few months will be mainly looking at an expansionary physical policy, meaning increasing um, uh, spending, okay? Um, uh, so in order to um, try to move the economy from point A to point C without going to somewhere in the left, obviously this is a very optimistic scenario that you could do that, okay? But in reality, you might be somewhere still in the left, so kind of going into recession, but at least an expansionary uh, physical policy would help to mitigate the negative effect of this recession. Okay, and that's what they will be trying to do over the next few uh, weeks and months. So anyway, so I just wanted to show you that this is uh, this sort of analysis could be used to analyze different uh, different situation. What I'm going to do today is mainly. Um, I'm going to build on what we already discussed related to the aggregate demand and aggregate supply uh, model. What I'm trying to understand today is a more realistic situation where prices um, are not fixed, but also they are not uh, flexible. Okay, so in the short run or even the medium run, so as you depart from that assumption that you made about a horizontal uh, aggregate supply curve, okay, then you move to more toward a more realistic case and we'll, we'll try to see what uh, sort of explanation, what can explain that upward uh, sloping or upward slope for the uh, aggregate supply curve. So we will consider two models or two explanations, okay? One which is sticky price model, which we already started talking about before, when we said, well, prices in the very short run or in the short run, they are fixed. Um, in the long run, they are very flexible or perfectly flexible, but in the, short, in the medium run or between these two points, they're kind of sticky. So they change, but they are very slow. So they change very slowly, okay? Or gradually, so they don't jump. So basically, they adjust over some time. They need some time to, to adjust. So and in both models, the other model, which is uh, imperfect information, so that based the whole idea of positive relationship between uh, uh, output and prices in the short run based on the imperfect inf information, and we'll see what that means. But in both cases, we would have an upward sloping uh, aggregate supply curve in the short run. So we agree that in the long run, we have a vertical line. We have the aggregate supply curve is a vertical line in the long run. But in the short run, it depends what you assume about 
the prices. If prices are fixed, so that means you have a horizontal aggregate supply curve, and everyone would, would, would agree with, or most people would agree with this, that it, as you move away from the long run or even relax that assumption, you would have um, an upward sloping uh, aggregate supply curve. And that's what we will try to look at today, why the aggregate supply curve is upward sloping uh, or what would happen if prices are sticky, so meaning they need time to adjust or they're not as flexible as they will be in the long run. How that will affect our analysis, as I said in the previous lecture, this shouldn't affect our analysis by much because the, do, the, the main difference here will be that prices will change slightly or gradually, okay? But the effect on output obviously uh, probably will be the same direction regardless of whether you have um, uh, fixed prices or a horizontal aggregate supply curve or upward sloping uh, supply curve in the short run. So both models, so whether you, you look at the sticky price model or the imperfect information uh, model, both will have the same uh, aggregate supply curve, which you see, which uh, the one you see now on the, on the screen. So why output is a relationship between, or that aggregate supply curve is a relationship between Y, the output level, which is Y on the left-hand side, and on the right-hand side, you have, <coughs> you have uh, the, uh, the full employment uh, output level, which is Y bar, plus some uh, parameter here, which is assumed to be positive, parameter alpha, which is assumed to be positive, and what is between bracket here is the difference between the actual price level and the expected price level, okay? So given that this is positive, so that means this alpha is positive, so we would imagine that the slope of this curve will be uh, positive, other things being equal, so meaning that um, we would have upward sloping curve rather than uh, a horizontal uh, uh, curve or line. So moving from here then, if we look at what the sticky price model tell us or how it explains this sort of um, slope for the aggregate uh, supply uh, curve. Um, so there are different reasons or many reasons uh, why prices are sticky. So why firms cannot change uh, prices very uh, quickly, why do they need time to change prices? So the question here, why prices are sticky? Okay, so maybe they have uh, contracts, there's time contracts, so contracts between firms and consumers at certain prices, so they can't change prices uh, until these contracts expire. Maybe they, once they uh, print their uh, uh, menus and they, uh, they, they advertise their prices, it is costly to change that. So they wouldn't do that very often or uh, whenever prices change, they can't respond immediately to that change. So they need time to adjust or time to change their prices. Or maybe the just firms do not want to uh, annoy their customers by frequent uh, price changes as, response, as a response to uh, uh, different economic conditions. So they, that's why it takes time for them to change prices. So there are different reasons why prices are sticky, why prices do not respond immediately to macroeconomic conditions, uh, and, and that, that could be the reason. So in this model, firms set all their own prices, so they would imagine that these firms they are not operating in a, a perfectly competitive market. They rather operate in a monopolistic competition where they have some uh, market power, okay? So to be able to change your prices, because you, I'm sure you remember that from microeconomics, if you have a perfect competition or a perfectly competitive market, so that means firms operate in this sort of market are price takers, so they don't change, they have no effect, they have no, sorry, influence on, on prices, so they can't set their prices, their own prices. So the prices in, this, in, 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 in such market would be mainly determined by aggregate supply and aggregate, care, aggregate demand. But to assume this, then you need to assume that 
or to assume that firms have some who can change their uh, prices, that means the environment in which they operate should be at least monopolistic competition where they have some uh, uh, market power. So in this model, let's say now we have um, or a firm uh, wants to set its prices and to do so, what they want to do here, so this small p here is uh, the price that would uh, a firm, let's say x or y, would uh, 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 charge. And that will be, or will depend on the price level, so that's the uh, general price level, and also um, will depend on the difference between these two, or that gap between the actual uh, output and the full employment output level, which is y bar, okay? We assume this alpha, this parameter is positive, so it's greater than one. So if output uh, at the natural rate, so if y equal y bar, so obviously this will cancel out, okay? And that means uh, the firm's or each firm's optimal price will be as the same as the price level, which is the capital B. So small b will be exactly the same as uh, that big B, which is the, which refers to the, um, the uh, overall price level. So if the economy is weak, or when the economy is uh, in going through a bad time, that means the actual output level will be somewhere below the uh, full employment output level, and that means firms will set their prices lower, okay? Um, the other, in the other case where we have, uh, when we have good time, when we have, when the economy is going through uh, a boom, um, meaning there's high demand, and that means this Y, the actual output level, will be greater than, greater than the uh, natural rate of output, the Y bar, okay? And in such case, of course, that firms will set their prices uh, uh, higher. So we want to build on that. So let's assume now we have two types of firms because the whole discussion now uh, based on whether prices are fixed or sticky. So this model assumed that, okay, if we have two types of firms, one which can adjust their prices freely so they don't have any problems so whenever there is a change in market conditions or macroeconomic conditions they can change their prices uh, freely or very flexible so then these type of firms with flexible prices will follow what we just described now so there's no expectation here okay so they are, they um, immediately they can change their prices Okay, so we have a fraction of, of firms in the economy that they do, they, they, they uh, enjoy this flexibility in sitting, when they set their prices, they, they can respond immediately to, to uh, uh, macroeconomic condition. So in such a case, you wouldn't see any expectations here because whenever there's a change, they can respond immediately and they can change their prices accordingly. So that's the first uh, group which we already discussed, so P, or the price for this type of um, uh, firms will be equal to the overall price or the aggregate price level, or the general price level, plus some type of uh, parameter here, and this is the gap between the actual output and the full employment uh, output level, and that means they can adjust their prices when they want, okay? So the other type of firms which uh, face or which uh, 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 their prices are uh, sticky, uh, then they need to make some expectation. They need to set their prices well in advance uh, based on what they expect for the future. Okay? So before they know the actual price level, before they know the actual output level, they need to make, they need to set their prices, and once they set them, they can't change them for some time. So the prices are sticky, okay? So they can't respond immediately to macroeconomic uh, changes. 
So in this case, you, you start to see expectations here. So rather than uh, setting their prices based on the, um, the current uh, or the price level, the overall price level, they basically set their prices based on the expected price level. Remember the difference between both firms that the first firm can adjust, can change their prices immediately so they don't need to uh, rely on any expectation. So once they have, uh, there's a change in the price level, they can change their prices accordingly. Okay? But the second type of firms, okay, uh, these firms uh, cannot do the same, so they don't enjoy the same, so they, they, they need to so when they set their prices, they don't know what P is, what the actual price level is, so they need to rely on some expectation of the price level and also of the um, uh, output level. So that's why you'll see in their equation here, you'll see that we start using the E uh, superscript, which refers to um, expectations. So the price that is charged or uh, by these um, firms with the sticky prices will be dependent on the expected price level. Again, we have some positive parameter here times this gap between what they expect the actual uh, or Y would be compared to what they expect for Y bar, which is the full employment uh, level. So from here, we could say if we have a fraction of the firms or the total number of firms in the economy that is faced with sticky prices, let's call that fraction uh, um, S. And if the rest of those firms will be 1 minus S. So S here will be a fraction of firms that face sticky prices, and the rest will be 1 minus. Uh, 1 minus s, okay? And also we'll assume that firms or the firms that are faced with um, uh, sticky prices, they will, um, they expect that the ye here will be equal or the actual output level or the expected output level will be equal the uh, expected y bar, meaning that the prices they will set basically here will be based on how what they expect for the price level so if these two are equal then that means this is zero so that means so this will cancel out here so that means the price um, uh, this type of firms will will charge will be exactly the uh, expected price so from here we can as I said using that assumption we made about the number of or the fraction of firms that are faced with sticky prices so the overall price will be the sum of these two okay so you have here this is these are the fraction s the fraction of firms that are uh, faced with sticky prices and the their price will be uh, based on expected prices on the other hand you have the rest, which is 1 minus S times, um, again, you don't have any expectation on this side because they basically, they set their prices, they are, they are faced with flexible price setting, so they can change their prices whenever there is a change in, uh, to macroeconomic conditions. So from here, you can just simplify this further, and you can get an equation of uh, P, or the price level. So in that case, of course, if you sub subtract both sides here and you follow these steps, you will get, at some point, you get this, this uh, expression here. So what I want to look at quickly is what does this tell us? So just I want to say this from here, I just came to this one, so you can, you can drive this expression of the price level which tell us two or three things. The first one is if we have high, if you expect high prices, if firm expect high prices, so P with the superscript E, expected prices, 
are high, so that means the actual price level will be high. Okay? So, of course, if firms expect high prices, we have two types of firm. S firms, which those, are those firms that are faced with sticky prices, because they set their prices based on expectations, so they will, they will set their prices high. And also the other, the other group which can adjust, which can uh, uh, enjoy that flexibility when they set their prices, will do, they will set their prices high as well. So the other, the other uh, point that we can learn from here is why, if we have um, a high um, output level, so that means the prices will be high. Again, because when Y is high, that means there's a high demand, and high demand for good means, uh, again, prices will be higher. So the greater the, flag, the fraction of the flexible uh, uh, price firms, okay, which is this one minus S, this is the third point, what we can learn from this expression, and the smaller this is, so the greater 1 minus is, the smaller this is. And that means the effect on the change of output level on the price level will be higher. Okay? So these are three points or three things, or three takeaway messages from this expression. Okay? So this is something we learn now. So higher expected prices means uh, higher prices. Higher uh, output level or actual Y means higher prices and also the greater the fraction uh, 1 minus s or those who are faced with uh, who can adjust their prices uh, quickly uh, or the smaller the fraction on the other side the smaller the fraction of those who cannot uh, that means changes in y will be translated very quickly to changes in, in, in on the price level okay so higher I, higher Y, sorry, higher uh, output or higher income means higher demand, and that will be translated uh, quicker uh, to uh, higher prices. So from here, as I said before, we're going to look at, or we're going to end up to the same point. So let me just show you where I said that. Just, this is exactly what, this is our destination. That's why I put it first. This is our destination. Okay, this is the aggregate supply equation, the, or the equation for the aggregate supply curve. So from here, this is basically what we've been building up here in this model. So from this equation or this expression, which I used uh, in the previous slide, so you can drive an equation uh, for the aggregate supply curve by solving this for y, and this is this is exactly the the uh, the AS or the aggregate supply curve equation that I showed you in the beginning. And in this expression, this what alpha means or what that parameter means, it's S over one uh, minus S times A, and this is expected to be uh, positive. So this is the, so what this tell us, it tell us again, that the aggregate supply curve should be upward sloping curve. So if you want to put the story in words, or what that tell us, it tells us that again that the aggregate supply curve, so the sticky price model, tell us that the short run aggregate supply curve should be um, upward sloping uh, supply curve. Uh, just one final point to make about this, which is when S here is big and A, this S, and A is small, that means the aggregate supply curve will be flatter. And that means output has greater response to uh, price change. So that's the first model. The second model, again, arrive the same destination. So it goes to that destination here. So we we going. So according to that model, we will go back to that point again, which is the aggregate supply curve is upward sloping uh, curve. So in this case. There are some assumptions. Um, these assumptions are based on uh, imperfect information, uh, meaning that, well, one, market, market's clear, so prices and wages are free to adjust. So we're not talking about sticky prices now. We say both um, can adjust, uh, prices and wages are allowed to adjust such in such a way where 
it owes um, or there's that uh, uh, equality between uh, supply and demand. So supply and dem supply equal demand in both the goods market and the labor market. But because of uh, market imperfection in the short run, uh, or what you can call uh, temporary uh, uh, misperception about prices, that causes the, the aggregate supply curve to be different in the short run compared to how it looks like in the long run. So tell us it will be upward sloping in the short run, but in the long run it is uh, low, uh, it's, it's, it's a vertical line. And that, the main reason here is that because uh, producers are not able to distinguish between a shock to their own prices, P, small p, and a shock to the uh, general uh, level of prices. Okay? So that means when, whenever the price change, they don't know really whether that change because of the general price level has changed or the what happened here is just the price change because, or the price on their product changed because basically there's higher demand on their product. So in this case, in the latter case, where, where the price changed because there's more demand on their product, so their, respond should, their response should be uh, to increase their, their production. Okay, so if there's higher demand in your product, then you should increase production. But because they're not sure or they don't know whether that change it happened because the overall price has changed or just because of this uh, uh, demand, uh, higher demand in their product, that's what we call the um, signal extraction problem. So they can't really, they're not really sure about what exactly happened. And that takes time to, to realize. So the best response whenever price change, whenever price increase, is to increase output regardless whether that happened because of a change in the overall price or just because of there's high demand on their price. So in that case, because they don't know, so that what, what their response would be will be just change their prices too, okay? So, and that's why you will see this uh, upward sloping curve, uh, 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 aggregate supply curve. So this just take us to more detail about how prices are set based on that uh, model where supply here of each, each good depends on relative prices, so nominal price divi divided by, uh, nominal price of the good divided by the overall uh, price. So if suppliers don't, don't really know whether, uh, 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 which one is, has changed, is it the overall price or the uh, price for their product, they also don't know the overall price, so they have some expectation about the overall price. So basically, they use the overall price. So that builds, building on that, it's again, it just explained that upward sloping or why the aggregate supply curve in the short run will be different from the aggregate supply curve in the long run. It's because if there's any change to the prices, so if PEEP rises, but uh, expected prices uh, didn't uh, change, so the supplier will think that relative prices has risen, and that means they will produce more. Remember, so any change in the price, regardless of the why price has changed, so because they have this problem, they don't know, so what they would do, the, how they're going to respond, they're going to basically to increase their production. Okay, so there's increase in prices, they increase their production. And if we have many producers thinking the same way, that means we, uh, y will rise whenever uh, P uh, rises above the expected uh, uh, prices level, which means again this positive relationship between uh, P and, uh, and Y or the upward sloping uh, uh, short run aggregate supply uh, curve. So it's mainly because of this confusion between uh, relative prices and the aggregate price level. Uh, some other models or recent models that tried to develop this, uh, this work, they base their um, conclusions or they arrive to the same conclusion based on the fact that people, it's not just the confusion, it's not the confusion about prices, it's mainly because people or economic agents cannot process all the information available and make decisions based on that. So whatever the reason is, so this is not our problem in this module, so mainly what we're looking at here is an explanation of why we have upward sloping uh, aggregate supply curve. So according to the sticky price model, we understand why 
we have some uh, firms that they can't adjust uh, their um, prices uh, uh, immediately, but then we have other, another group of firms that they can. But here we talk about mainly misperception or uh, producers that they cannot distinguish between a shock to their the, 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 their own prices and the overall price. And that's why whenever there's a shock or whenever there's a change to the price, then they just produce more. So this kind of r positive relationship between P and, uh, and Y. So in that sense, we would have, again, we'd have that upward sloping uh, uh, aggregate supply curve. So whatever, whatever explanation you think is more reasonable, so the, uh, the main conclusion or the destination that again we would see is an upward sloping uh, curve, which is summarized by this equation, okay? Or if you want to plot that, you will have this upward um, aggregate supply, short run aggregate supply curve. So the whole story today is based on why this aggregate supply curve is upward sloping. So we haven't changed anything we did last time. We, did, we relaxed the assumption, the extreme assumption that we, or the strong assumption that we said, all prices are fixed in the, in the, in the short run. Now we, we talk about a more realistic situation where according to the sticky price model, there are some or a fraction of firms that they can adjust a fraction and another fraction of firms or the rest of the firms cannot. Um, or based on uh, the imperfect information model, we have this sort of confusion between the overall price and the um, price of the uh, individual or, or for individual firms, and that uh, lead to whenever uh, there's a price change, producers or suppliers basically they change their their output accordingly, and that's why we have this upward sloping curve. So now the conclusion is that in the long run we will have this vertical line, the long run aggregate supply curve, that's not, that has changed, this is something we already discussed last time, but what we discussed today is why, or there are two reasons or two theoretical models that try to explain why this aggregate supply, the short run aggregate supply curve is upward sloping, it is not a horizontal curve or horizontal line. So whenever the, if the price, if the price level, if the actual price level equal the expected price level will be here at this point where the, this uh, aggregate supply or long run aggregate supply curve is, but any point above that, so means meaning that when prices or when actual prices are higher than the expected prices, that means it would be somewhere on this uh, part of the aggregate supply curve, the short run aggregate supply curve. So we're kind of deviating from that long run vertical uh, 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 line. Or the other uh, case when prices or the actual prices are below the expected price level, again, will be on this part of the, um, of the aggregate supply curve. And that explains why the, um, as we said, there are two explanations, the sticky price model or the uh, imperfect information model, both explain why. Uh, so both they have different reasoning, different explanation of why, but the destination or the conclusion is the same. That the aggregate supply curve, uh, the short run aggregate supply curve is uh, upward sloping. Then building on this, we could um, do the same sort of analysis we used last time. So the only difference here is that we don't have a the short run aggregate supply curve is not horizontal line, it's upward sloping uh, uh, curve. And that will tell you how now, if we have, for example, a positive uh, change or a positive or a, uh, the aggregate demand curve shift to the right, um, that means there's a, have a, a positive shock or the actual Y is uh, somewhere above the Y bar here. Again, over time, the price or expected prices P or PE will rise, that means this will shift the aggregate supply or the short run aggregate supply curve to the right, going back to point C. So we move from point A in the short run to point B, but then over time as prices adjust or expectation about prices adjust, 
that means the aggregate supply curve or the short run aggregate supply curve will shift to the left and then we move to that point C where again the actual price level will be equal the um, uh, expected price level and we, we will return to the full time uh, 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 sorry the full employment uh, output level. Uh, you could use the same uh, sort of, uh, of analysis to um, explain a negative shock. So, um, so what, what you see here is a negative oil price shock and how that will affect um, the equilibrium in the long run. So what I did here is just exactly the same thing we did last time, we, but rather than having um, a horizontal uh, aggregate supply curve, we have upward sloping aggregate supply curve. Uh, next time when, uh, when we meet, we will talk about, uh, when, when we meet next week, we'll talk about Phillips curve, the relationship between uh, inflation rate and the unemployment rate. Do you have any questions? Okay, have a nice weekend. I'll see you next week. Thank you.